Friday night, man, we had our more night. It was awesome. Uh, did uh, we, man? God just showed up, and it was just fun to listen to some of the team and, and testimonies. We had multiple people uh, get baptized with the Holy Spirit, and um, uh, a lot of times with that, there's the evidence of speaking in tongues or your prayer language, and multiple people uh, received that. And I know people that just came up to the prayer line that really got ministered to in a powerful way. And uh, and in my own heart, uh, I just feel. I can feel that there's this almost beckoning from God right now. Uh, I feel this, uh, like, you know, we go from glory to glory, uh, that God takes us on. This is the, the, the train that we're on is moving forward, and that tra- the path is glory to glory. And, uh, and I feel like there's a, a new level, if you, I don't know the right way to say that or the perfect theological framework to, men- to say that, but I do feel like there's just a, there's a glory that God is inviting us into and, and I'll be honest with you, for me, in, in, in my own heart, I feel like it's going to require something of me. Like, I feel like it's going to, it actually is, in a good way, going to cost me something. And I even can feel the, the, that almost makes you a little nervous or hesitant. Uh, you know, I remember when I was young and just hungry for God and had all this zeal, it was almost like I really didn't care. I just wanted it at all cost. But as I've gotten a little bit older, I realized that, like, man, it's going to cost me something. There might be some adjustments, there may be some things, whatever, that we have to let go of, but, but I know that it's worth it. I know the glory and the presence of God, and that when He shows up, that, man, everything changes. And it's like, even, even in moments, I, I, we, we, we leave our dreams, we leave our ambitions, we leave our goals, and it just becomes about the one thing. And it just becomes about His presence and Him. And so I, I feel that in my own heart. In a prayer, I'm just, I'm just praying, God, do something significant in me. God, I want more of you. I want, I want to experience you in a significant way. So anyway, I just, I'm so thankful and grateful for what God is doing. Um, you know, I, I really think it's uh, whatever you steward well increases. You know, this can be friendships. This can be your business. This can be finances. This is just a kingdom value. This can be praying for the sick. Whatever we, whatever we steward well. It's one reason for me why I love sharing testimonies is because we're giving honor to what God is doing. We're bringing, we're celebrating, and we're honoring what the Father is doing, and that when we steward that well, it actually brings increase. And so my heart for for us is to steward the presence of God, to steward what He's doing well, and really honor that and bring light to that. Um, I'm going to be in Mark chapter 11. I'm taking another shot at a, at a, uh, a message that I did last week, but I'm going to land in a different place today. Um, I know in here nobody's ever dealt with disappointment. I'm kidding. The truth is, is if, you've, if you're living life, you have dealt with loss or disappointment. There's, at times, there's places where we've been discouraged, and I want to go after that today, um, but I'm going to start from a verse that I, I began last week, and it's in Mark chapter 11. In my own journey with God, uh, growing, kind of growing up in, in Southern Christianity, uh, the book, the Bible, used to feel like uh, this limiting book, if you will. Like it felt like this sort of almost heavy religious books that was a bunch of do's and don'ts, and it was sort of behavior modification. And you've got the nice guys and good guys, and you have good behavior and you have bad behavior, and you have the good people and the bad people. And uh, and anyway, I just kind of grew up with with that <clears throat> almost belief about the Word of God. But as I as I grew and learned this from my parents and learned this in other places as well, the more I read the Bible, the more I realized that it was actually extremely empowering. The more I read the Bible, the more I realized that it's actually an invitation into more. That there's that this book, and, and really even in the Old Testament, but in, in the life of Jesus and a lot of the, the writings of Paul, like there is so much permission in the scriptures. It is it is an empowering book and 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 my heart, the more I read it, the more I realized that God was inviting me into more, that He was inviting me into something greater. And and I, and it actually touched a part that a deep longing of my heart that I wanted more and I wanted a life of significance. And the more I read the Bible, the more I was like, man, I'm reading about what Jesus did and these wild things that he said. And I'm reading what Paul wrote and I'm like, man, I want this in my life. I want more. And, and I loved it because the more I read it, the more I realized that Jesus was like, come on, there's more. There's always more. There's always glory to glory. And so 
Mark 11 uh, is one of these verses that is a, I would just say it's a wild statement. I mean, it's a, it's a big statement. It is not a limiting verse. It's actually a very empowering verse. And it's around the story of the barren fig tree. Uh, Jesus here is at the end of his ministry. He's towards the end. I think it's about a week or so here until he's crucified. And he actually makes the big triumphal, triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And it's where they're really hailing him as the uh, Messiah. And they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And they're really praising him as the Messiah and that he's going to come and restore Israel. He's going to come and set them free from the Roman occupation. And he's going to restore them to the good old days, if you will, of the days of when David was king and uh, this great reign that Israel had. And so I think there was this sort of belief that he was going to do that. And they were hailing him as the king. And uh, so he comes in into Jerusalem. There's this big moment. And then he actually checks out the city. And then he leaves and he goes out to Bethany, which um, I believe is a couple miles away. And anyway, we're going to pick up here. He's actually coming back into the city, and it's in Mark 11, verse 12. And it says, the next day, so again, this is the day right after he had the big uh, triumphal entry. And it says in verse 12, the next day when he came out from Bethany, he was hungry. Anybody ever been hungry? Getting hungry for that Chick-fil-A? And he was hungry. Maybe this is the reason he he cursed the fig tree. He was just kind of upset because he was actually hungry. After seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And and the disciples heard it. I think that's just a significant uh, little statement there. And the disciples heard it. This was something that obviously Jesus wanted his disciples to to see and hear. He was doing something in the moment that was significant, and he wanted them to see this moment. And it's interesting because then he ends up going back into Jerusalem. It's when he cleanses the temple, and he says, you know, he goes in there with the rope, he cleanses the temple, and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Many people uh, would say that the fig tree was a representation of Israel and that it was a, a, a... revealing, if you will, that Israel was not producing fruit at the time and that Jesus went into the temple where obviously there should be fruit being produced and he cleansed the temple and he's you know, really correcting them. Uh, they also would say, and, and I, I like this idea, this picture as well, is that uh, Jesus was revealing to them that uh, we should be able to produce fruit in any season. That we, no matter what, that Christ is coming in and he's establishing a new kingdom, if you will. And in this kingdom, Christ is actually going to be living inside of us. And it doesn't matter what's happening around us, that inside of us we should always be able to produce fruit. If you abide in me and my words in you, what? We know that we'll produce fruit. When we abide in him and him and us, we produce fruit. And that it's also a picture of this reality that no matter, again, whatever's happening around us, no matter what's happening in America, what's happening in the government, whatever, that we can still produce fruit. We can still, revival can still be happening right here. That I'm always connected to the presence of God. That He lives inside of me and that there is no separation. And He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. But it doesn't matter the circumstances. But I can live in the peace and the presence of God. Like, come on. I, I believe that's so true in the day that we live in. Personally, I don't think we have to live in a dry season. I believe God's always speaking. I believe we live in the season where God is pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. That's every single one of us. Every now and then He may change the way He does something. And He may you know, adjust us a little bit because it's not a formula and he's inviting us into relationship. But God's always speaking. He's always pouring out a spirit. That's the day that me and you live in. And I think that this is a a picture of that as well. So then the next day, they're coming back by this old fig tree. and, And this is verse 20. And it says, early in the morning as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. Jesus said to him, have faith in God. I mean, listen to this statement. This is, this is wild. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples. Personally, in my own you know, study of this, a lot of times I do think that we try to kind of dumb this down and make this as big as us. 
uh, because we're trying to understand it, our need to understand. But I think God is actually inviting His disciples and us into a place where we have God-like faith where we have godly faith. Like, obviously, we, want to have, we, we have faith in God. We believe in God. We believe in our heart. We confess with our mouth, and it's how we're saved. I've heard it said that many times we repent enough to be forgiven and to be saved, but we don't repent enough to see the kingdom of God. And that I, I think that God is actually inviting us and inviting His disciples into this life of He's trying to show them that, hey, what I'm doing, you actually can do. I'm actually inviting you into this lifestyle where nothing is impossible with me. And he says, have faith in God. If you actually look up that in the Aramaic, it is God-like faith or godly faith. Have godly faith. I assure you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. I mean, that's wild. (laughs) And does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen, and it will be done for him. It's interesting, too, that word doubt there, it means undecided, that I'm undecided in my heart. That if I'm, if I'm, so the, the, obviously the opposite of that would be that I'm, I've decided that I believe God. I've decided, like I'm, I'm making that up in my heart. It's a conviction that I have. I have a conviction of the unseen. It's, I think that is, there's something so powerful about that, that that I am gonna, I'm going to wrap my heart and believe and embrace that nothing is impossible with God. And I would say it like this, that I am going to work hard because it's true to live my life as if God was real. Like I want to actually live my life that way. Like I want to live my life like we know He's real, but I want to live my life as if what God said and what He's saying is true. And I want to work hard to live my life, that I live in that way. And make that decision. Like that's a, that's a powerful decision. Therefore, I tell you, all things you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them and you will have them. I mean, that's wild. Therefore, I tell you, in some translations it says, whatever you ask for, believe that you've received them and you will have them. I really unpacked this last week. I'm going to land somewhere different today. Um, but that word, whatever, there's, I do believe that, so Jesus is saying, whatever you believe, whatever you pray, believe that you've received it, don't doubt it in your heart, and you'll receive it. And I believe that word, whatever, when he's saying, like, you know, whatever you pray, uh, I think there is context to that. And I think we, you know, at this time, the disciples didn't have all the New Testament. You know, we have the, the Gospels and all Paul's writings and all the other writings as well. And I do believe that that whatever is the will of God. And, and there's actually a, a verse in, in 1 John, um, <clears throat> if I can find it real quick, I'll read it for you because it's a, it's a good one. And he, and he pretty much says that if we pray, here it is, 1 John five fourteen. this is the confidence which we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. So this is the confidence which we have. If we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. If we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the request we made for Him. So we've got some context here, and I believe the disciples did as well. Like This is towards the end of Jesus' ministry, so He's been walking with these guys uh, for somewhere around three years. And so they've, they've experienced Him. They understand His message. They've listened to Him. They've heard Him. They've heard His teaching. They understand that He's taught them before that when you pray, pray like this, that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That they kind of have this understanding of the heart of Jesus. They know that Jesus has taught them, when you see me, you've seen the Father. They, they kind of have this understanding of who God is, and they've had relationship with Jesus. They've seen how He's interacted with people and healed the sick and raised the dead, and how He's loved people and shown grace to people, and all of those things. So they have all this experience with Him, and so I think there was some context for them of what that whatever is. The, the, the challenge for you and me is, is that the will of God actually makes us bigger than we are. It actually, the kingdom is a whole lot bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Like when, when God's actually saying, hey, you can pray from heaven to earth, like that actually means that, that we can partner with God and His kingdom. That means we can heal the sick, we can raise the dead, we can cleanse the lepers. I mean, even, I, I shared this a little bit last week, um, Peter walked on water. He said, when they were out there, he said, Jesus, if that is you, then command me to walk on the water. So Peter put a demand on something that Jesus had made available to him. 
And I believe that for you and me, like that's the, that's the challenge. That's the beauty is that now we can actually partner with God to demonstrate heaven on earth. And that is not a limiting thing. That's actually a very empowering thing for us. Y'all doing all right? Come on. I just, I just know I, I, I want to have faith. I want to have godly faith. I, I, want to, I want to step into and walk out everything that God has made available to us. So today, I want to, I want to land somewhere. I actually dove uh, deeper into that last week. Um, but today, I, I want to, I'm actually going to go towards disappointment. You want, you want me to know what I think one of the, the biggest goals of the enemy is? Like, if there's something that he can do to you and me, like, I think one of his biggest goals, like, if, and, and I, in some ways, I know this may not be fully true, like, sometimes I don't even know if he really cares if we're saved or not. Like, obviously he does, but, but I, I feel like even more important is where he wants us to land. And you want to know where I think that is? In a place of unbelief. I think his goal, if he can get some believers to be unbelieving believers, like if he can get us to this place, and I think there's a lot of uh, ways that he comes in and does this. I mean, it can be through complacency. It can be through I'm okay without revival. Um, it can be through disappointment and hurt and pain. I mean, there's a lot of things that if he can get a foothold in us and he can begin to build a case in me towards God, if he can do that and he can start to manipulate us and use the, the things that we've had to navigate in life, trauma and things like that, where I begin to build this case that sort of justifies my unbelief. And to be honest with you, in the kingdom, that's just not okay. In the kingdom, like Jesus, many times he would, he would, he would, he never did. He, he wasn't like to his disciples, hey, you idiots, hey, you dummies, like y'all are less than, y'all are no good. Like actually he was trying to teach them that you're actually the righteousness of God that you're a son of God, that I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends, that he was working on their identity. Like, this is who you are. You're a beloved son of God. Like, this is who we are. We read through the scriptures of, of like the identity that we have in God. But the thing that he would go after is he did challenge their faith. Many times he would say, hey, ye of little faith. And he also celebrated, I love the story of one of the, the centurion stories, where he would celebrate when he saw great faith. And he was like, I hadn't seen this. And even, I love it, you kind of think about it. I mean, it'd be pretty awesome to marvel Jesus. But the centurion who told Jesus just to speak the word and my slave will be healed, he said, Jesus said of this man, and that did happen, Jesus just spoke the word. He didn't even go and lay hands on him or anything. He just spoke the word. And when they returned, the slave was healed. And, and listen to this. I mean, this is amazing. And it says, and Jesus marveled at him. Like Jesus was amazed at him. I think that's awesome. I mean, who wants to like make Jesus like be like, wow, that's pretty awesome. Like Jesus was marveled at my faith. And he says he marveled at his faith. And he says, I have not seen faith like this in all of Israel. Like he honored, like for me, again, that's why I love celebrating testimonies and all these things. Like, man, you're, you're honoring where you just see God moving and you see the faith of God. And he honored that. And so there's this thing of, of, of the goal of the enemy is he wants us to be unbelieving believers. He just wants us to get in this spot where, man, maybe we, we even practice Christianity and we do all the right things and we become the nice guys and all that. But I believe God is looking for people that have a conviction of the unseen, that have a conviction and believe in what is possible with God. And He's looking for people that won't fall into that. And, I, I wanna, and I'm, I'm going to go after the, the disappointment because I think disappointment is one of those places that if we're not careful, disappointments will lead us, and the enemy's like leading us right into this place of unbelief. And the truth is, is man, we can, we can get stuck over there, and we can just hang out over there, and we just start building these cases in our hearts towards God. So I want to unpack that today, because the truth is, if we're honest, we've all been there, and maybe we're even there right now. And, and what, you, know what, you know what the amazing thing is, is that God loves you. He loves you. Like it, it really, it, it, at the end of the day, like it's okay. He does love you, but he does want to bring us into this place of having faith. So, disappointment, what a fun topic. <clears throat> I want to give you, I, I can only imagine, I know in my own life, I, I can only imagine some of the situations and circumstances that people in this room have had to face. I can only imagine. I mean, I think about things in my own life and even in the past few years where I have 
where whether me or seeing other people in the faith walk through some of the most impossible situations. I mean, walk through things that are just so challenging. And I know every one of us in this room, we've dealt with loss. We've dealt with disappointment. There's been times where we've been discouraged. And I know, if, if we're honest, we've all kind of come over, probably landed in this place of unbelief before. And we've all, like, if you've lived life, like, this just happened. And there's been times, I can, I can only imagine, where, where it, it felt like, and I'm going to unpack this, where it felt like, God, you didn't hold up your end of the deal. Like it felt like, man, like I, we believe God. We got the prophetic word. We prayed for the sick. We did what you said to do. And we went after it, and it didn't turn out the way that we thought it would. We didn't, it, like, it looked like, man, God, it didn't look like you, you did what you said you were going to do. And the question is, is what do I do in that space? What do I do right there? Because it's really, really significant. And, and the truth is, is, is this just happens to us. It happens to people so many times. Like, man, we tap out because of that. Oh, man, and so I want to give you some things. So what do we do in disappointment? Number one, and I've got about eight things here I just want to hit with us real quick. Just eight quick ones. Each of them will take about 30 minutes. <clears throat> Number one, you got to have compassion for yourself. Compassion is huge. It says that the Father is the father of compassion. He goes a truck. <clears throat> He's the father of compassion. The reality is, is that whatever you walk through, the trauma that you walk through, the pain that you walk through, it was legit. It was real. It wasn't, it, you know, this is, <clears throat> the truth is, is that I, I don't, God's not trying to shame us. God's not trying to put us down or make us less than. But sometimes we, we have like understanding the compassion that God has for us and that He wildly is in love with us. There's something I was thinking about this in worship a minute ago. It says that if you love me, you'll obey me. It, it, like obedience comes out of love. Like it comes like obedience, like it's a natural overflow of like, man, when I know the love of God and I love God, it's like obedience is, it just happens. It's like I just want to obey God. And there's something about that, that when I know His love and I understand His compassion, it actually, there's a healing that happens in that, that motivates me to really do the thing that I'm going to talk about next. <clears throat> it motivates me that, and this is my, my number two thing, is, is that we have to confront it. We have to confront it. We can't gloss over it. We can't sweep it under the rug. We can't deny it. A lot of times there's a lot of denial, and we'll deny that something happened, and we're just kind of keep sweeping it under, and we don't actually confront it. Like it's, I, I, I can only, things can only be healed when I'm willing to confront them. I can't, again, I can't gloss over it. And, and the truth is, is that the, the enemy will keep feeding me, but the, the reality is, is that I, I have to be able to, with God, confront the disappointment and confront the pain. Because here's what happens, is a circumstance will come up. Something will happen close to you. Something will happen to us. And all of a sudden, out of, from the, kind of, out, of, out of the depths of who we are, let me say it this way, circumstances don't make or break us, they reveal us. Circumstances, they don't make or break us, like they reveal us. It's like revelation time. It's like when, when, when something comes up, and, and all of a sudden, there'll be a circumstance and it'll touch on a, a past pain. It'll touch all of a sudden, like you'll feel unresolved pain, unresolved disappointment come up, and I'm reacting to a circumstance out of something that happened a long time ago because I didn't confront, I didn't actually allow God and walk through the process of healing, and that pain is showing up today. And the reality is, is that again, it's revelation time. So this is encouraging, but not really. But all of a sudden what happens is, is I, I get my true faith in whatever the circumstance is. I find out, if you will, what I'm really made of. I find out not my perceived faith, but I actually find out what my true faith is in this moment. And so when that unresolved pain shows up, when that disappointment shows up, like this, I've got to, I've got to be able to take this to God. I can't, again, gloss over that, sweep it under the rug, because the problem is, is if I do that, I'm going to circle this mountain again. I'm gonna, this thing's going to show up again. It's still, if, if I don't take this thing to God, 
and deal with this disappointment, deal with this pain with the Lord. And the truth is, is that I need to get alone with God and I need to take this to God. So that's really my, when you see this, that's my third thing, is we have to get with God. It's so important to take that pain, to take that disappointment to the Lord. I'll say it like this in my own journey. Um, I think there's really two places that it's important for us to go. One is community and one is God. And, and I, I do think that um, sometimes, and, and this is my own journey, and, and, and it's interesting to me because as I've walked through my own pain or past or anything like that, in seasons God's really used people to, to, to really bring healing and restoration in my life and, and counseling. And, and I'll say this, I'm all for counseling. My wife and I see counseling. We just, we, I mean, some ways I almost call it like preventative counseling. <laughs> it's like you just want to stay checked in. I mean, for me, I'm like, I just want to grow. I just want to be as healthy as I can. And so I'm just willing. I'm, in my mind, I'm too valuable not to do it. I'm too valuable not to like take care of myself and make sure I'm emotionally healthy and all of that. And so, man, I'm all about getting help and counseling and sozos, whatever it looks like. I just, man, I just want more and I want to be a healthy person. I will say that in that, sometimes that stuff can only take you so far. At some point, it's like, I need God. At some point, I need the Father. At some point, I've got to get alone with him and take this disappointment to him, take this pain to him. And I love the story of Jacob where Jacob wrestled with God until he got the blessing. Like he was willing to, I mean, you think of it as like a wrestling match. I was like, God, sometimes there's things, and this would be, I think it's my fourth thing, is you've got to be brutally honest with God. You got to be honest with him. You got to be authentic with him. You can't go to him with my religious suit on or my mask on. He doesn't work with masks. He doesn't work well when, when I'm going there and I'm trying to present myself well to God, to look good to God. Like I've got to go get right and then go get with God. No, I just go to God authentically. I just go to Him and you, and you can, man, God can take it. Like He can. I mean, I would, I would advise you to, I mean, it's probably not good to accuse God, but He's not going to leave you. Like, you, like, you can, like, he can handle that. Like, he's not insecure. You can, like, he loves the, the, the wrestling match. And I mean, and, and I think he's even calling us into that because he wants us to be a part of it. And, and that's, I think that's my, my fourth thing is, is, is be honest, is be authentic with God. Take the mask off. Come vulnerably and real with him. Like, that, that is where he works. That's what he does, man. When we're honest with him, and, and, and I think even praying prayers like, hey, God, you, you know, we heard you say this. We believed we heard you. We prayed for this person, and they didn't get healed. It looked like you didn't hold up your end of the deal. I know that, like in my heart, I'm like, I know that's not your heart. I know that's not what you meant. I know that's not the way that, you know, and, and personally, I'm like, I know that even isn't your will, but it's like, God, what happened? Like, it, it just feels this way. Like, I'm hurt by this. Like, this is bothering me. It didn't feel like you held up your end of the deal. The reality is, is that God can take that. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. And it's actually in that place of vulnerability and rawness. Man, you, in that place, so many times, you'll just feel the breath of God. You'll feel, and let me say this, and sometimes for me, it's not even about even necessarily, you may not get the perfect answer. You know, sometimes I may not fully understand, but I'll tell you what, if I can, if I can experience, I need His peace again. I need his healing. I need the the breath. I need his voice. I need what he's saying because it's in that place where he changes my perspective. I get the joy of the Lord back. I get my strength back because the truth is for me is I don't want to begin to dumb down Jesus to look like me. I want to raise my experience to look like him. You know, like I, I don't want to try to explain, like I think sometimes in our efforts to encourage people and help people, you know, we try to bring Jesus down to our level. But the reality is, is my circumstances don't define who God is. Jesus did. Jesus is the one. He's the perfect image of the invisible God. He's the full nature of God. Why things didn't happen sometimes, I don't know, but I'm I'm not going to change who he is. I want to keep leaning into who Jesus is. And again, he, Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Job wasn't Jesus, you know. Like Jesus was Jesus. Like I want to know Jesus, and he's the one that we're following. So be honest, be authentic with God. I will say this, another thing I think would be the fifth one is don't fuel the disappointment. You know, whatever we meditate on is we're really just putting gas on the fire. And I, I've, this was even this week, and, and I mean, I'll be honest, and my, my, probably my biggest challenge usually is overthinking things. I can get in my head. I'm, I'm, I'm an internal processor, and I can just sit there and circle in my head about things. 
And this verse just hit me this week that he's who mind is stayed on the Lord is at perfect peace. I think I botched it a little bit. But there's pretty much that when my mind is stayed on the Lord, I'm at perfect peace. When my mind is stayed on the Lord, I'm at perfect peace. And so man, that is the, for me, I mean, we all know the neuro pathways that get created in our, our brains and all of that. And sometimes we have to, what, renew our minds. We actually have to repent, change the way that we think and start to think a new way, that we have new ways of thinking in our minds. And <clears throat> so it's important to meditate on the truth, to meditate on God. And it's in that place. Sometimes, again, I don't, you know, it's there. I know for us, sometimes there's this need to understand. I mean, even in me. And it's like when I can let that go and I can trust God and I just let his peace speak to me, even in the midst of the disappointment, in the midst of the pain, there's a strength that comes from that. I'll tell you something else. The sixth thing I think is really important is this is a this is a core foundation for me. I would say that it's something that's uh, impacted me more over the past probably two or three years uh, than maybe ever before. Is is get this resolved? God is good. I tell you what, if you can work that out in your heart, if you can work out and go wrestle with that and get that resolved. Like if there's still some belief in us that he's the angry guy upstairs, that he's the dictator, he's the boss, he's all, whatever, whatever negative experience maybe that we had growing up that's impacted our view and our filter of who God is, that if we can get the reality that God is good, man, that, that, just, that does things for you. It just, that is something, that's a, that's a hammer that just, or a nail that just needs to be nailed in us that like, man, he is good. And, and to be honest with you, um, <clears throat> I think that's something that obviously it comes from reading the Word of God, but I believe a lot of that comes out of our own personal relationship with God. It comes out of, in my own experience with Him, every, I mean, when I'm with Him, sure there's times where maybe He corrects you and does things like that, but every time I could, I'm around Him, every time I'm with Him, it's good. Every time I, I sense His presence or hear His voice or any of that, like, it's good. I remember I worked with these junior high kids one time, and we would do these four-hour solos where we would send them out into the wilderness, and uh, they would go and, and spend time with God for four hours. Four hours for junior high kids is like 20 years. I mean, they were like extremely nervous about this, like four hours, like, what am I going to do? You know, most of the time you send them out, and then you kind of send them out there about 15 minutes later. Somehow they all got together again. But, you know, give them, spread them out 10 minutes later, they're all together again. Or they're all just singing a song. You know, it's really funny. You're like, come on, you can do it 10 minutes. And, um, and so, but I would always tell them, I'd say, hey, go, go ask God what he thinks about you. I just want you to ask him, ask that one question and just go listen and see what he says. Just go ask God, what does he think about you? And, and I'll be, I don't, every, I don't think I ever heard any of them say anything that was negative. <laughs> like they would go and listen to God. And these are kids that are, you know, I, I don't know that they had, if you will, been religious-fied yet. You know, like, man, they're, they're still junior high kids. They're, their brains are still forming. I mean, they're just, and they would go listen to God. And, and man, every time they'd come back, I mean, it'd be like, man, God loves me. I was out there, and I had all this fear and worry about this. And I heard God say that it's going to be okay, and I felt peace, or I felt like for the first time that I'm loved and I'm a son or whatever it is. And they would, I mean, every time without doubt, I mean, they would just go around and share about what God had shared with them and spoke to them. And it was never this thing of like, man, you're an idiot, you're a dummy, you're stupid. You're, you know, it, was, it was always about hope and love and your identity and pulling them out. And so I, I just encourage us to work this thing out that God is good and He is the perfect Father. To me, that is the foundation of all theology, is that God is good and that He's the perfect Father. He's good and He's the perfect Father. I could stay there. <clears throat> the, the seventh thing is that when we go in and we're honest with God, I, I, I pretty much said this, but is that we got to wait on Him to respond. That I, 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 the, the reality is, is that if I go in and I just come back out the same way, then I actually didn't pray. I actually just complained. The truth is, is that when I actually can go in with God and be raw and be honest and be real, but I need, and I mean, this to me, it's personal. It's just, it's like, this is a personal thing. Like, I, I need him. I need his voice. I need his strength. I need him to speak something to me. And it's, again, it's that, it's that wrestling match that, that Jacob had that was like, I'm not leaving here until you bless me. 
It's like, I'm here because, God, I need this. I I need a change of perspective. This happened, and again, it felt like you didn't hold up your end of the deal, and and I'm hurt, and I'm offended, and I can tell that everything in me wants to go in this direction, but, God, I know in my heart that you're good. I know this is who you are, and and I want to hear your voice. I want to hear, I need your voice. I need something from you, God. And so I think that's it's huge that we allow him to speak to us. Because it's in that place that healing and restoration happens. The eighth eighth thing is ask ask God to forgive you and repent. Ask God to forgive you and repent. You got to ask God to forgive you. There's just so there's a humbling there of God forgive me. You know whatever it is, whatever I threw at Him, whatever I said about like God forgive me, and 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 repent is actually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the way I think. God, I actually want to change the way that I'm seeing this situation. I'm, I'm actually even going to work to set my mind on the things above. I'm going to work to set my mind on God. And, and I'm going to allow Him to speak to me so that even those neuropathways in my brain begin to get worked out in the right way. Where I start to have you know, pathways of trust, have pathways of leaning on God and not leaning on myself, I have pathways of actually beginning to see the world again through hope, that I'm actually seeing the world, that, that, that I'm not seeing the world through disappointment. And <clears throat> really where, where I want to land is what's so powerful is that if, if you can re- have that wrestling match and you can confront that and walk through that, there's a grace and a strength that comes out of that, that is so powerful. There's something that, man, when I'm, I'm willing to walk through that process with God, when all of a sudden I have a circumstance and all of a sudden some unresolved, I mean, there's, you know, it can be disappointment, it can be pain, it can be trial, there's so many things. But when that disappointment pops up and I see that and I'm willing to walk through that process with God, and man, there is an opportunity in the midst of that disappointment for a great victory. There, there's, there's an opportunity there for us to walk through a healing process that where we were weak, like now we're strong. And I've said this many times, but I love that in that verse when Paul says that. He actually says, I used to think it said where we're weak, he is strong. It actually says where we were weak, I am strong. It, it's in the context of his grace. It's in the context of him saying that my grace is sufficient for you in your weakness. But I do believe that there's actually a strength that, man, when I can get out of that place of where I'm offended, I'm hurt, I'm disconnected, I'm all of that, and I can walk through that and allow God to speak to me in those places, there's a strength that comes from God. I think there's, a, there's, an, a, there, there's things that, man, you're, I mean, it's the classic, your, your test becomes a testimony. Your mess and all of that, man, it becomes a message that God uses in you to actually bring freedom to other people. What happens is, is when I walk through that, I can engage again. I can trust God again. The intensity of that trigger, like it it decreases majorly. And I'm actually able, where things used to scare me and I used to get wobbly and felt insecure or felt disappointment when this happened, I'm actually able to face those things. I'm actually able to engage again. And I have hope. And I even have, there's a strength, a grace from God in that area. And we can pray for the sick again. We can believe God again. We're able to take feedback from people and it doesn't bother us. I mean, there's so many things. There's a strength that comes from that. But again, I would say this. You want to know what my personal, my personal belief is, is that in all of that, what the enemy wants, is he want, the reason he wants all of that to happen, that foothold, is because he wants us to land in a place of unbelief. He wants us to land in this place where we're disconnected. We're disconnected from God. We're disconnected from what he's doing. And, he, and he, he just wants us to be fueled in this place of unbelief. But you know what's crazy is? Is the devil always overplays his card. He just overplays his card. Because the problem is, is he hammers you in that area. And he tries to get you there. But all of a sudden, what, is, what, is, what does Jesus do? He takes something that's a mess and he turns it into something so beautiful. 
He turns it into where the enemy once had you. It's like now, like there's actually an anointing. There's a grace there. I'm actually able to release and, and bring other people into the freedom that I've experienced. I'm able to, to see people set free and the captive set free and the sick healed and all these things happen. Like now, actually, I can pray and it doesn't affect me as much. Like there's a strength and, that comes from that. And the enemy thought he was working you and he thought he had you and he thought he had you down. But the next thing you know, all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to experience freedom and healing in this area and there is a grace on my life now there's a strength that comes from that and the enemy's like oh dang it I just overplayed my hand and I <clears throat> and I, I just say that in the context of this verse because man you think about it this is one of those verses where, where Jesus is like you can pray whatever you want to pray if you believe obviously in the will of God but you can pray like man and there's so much in there that we can believe and if you don't doubt in your heart you believe that you received it it'll be done for you and I think this is actually the life that Jesus is calling us to. And it's possible with Him. So if you're able, I'm going to have the Adrian come back up. And if you're able, can you stand with me? I'm going to have our ministry team come up as well. I really do want, my heart today is to encourage you. Because I know in this room, every single one of us, and, and I, I think it's... In some ways, we live. We do live. We live on a battlefield. We live. Life is life is tough sometimes. Life is hard, and <clears throat> but I believe there's a place we can live in faith and hope. That's so powerful. That's so real. <clears throat> and I I just want to give people an opportunity this morning that if you're dealing with discouragement. Maybe even know that there's some unresolved thing there. Or you feel disconnected or disappointed or you've dealt with loss. And, and maybe you're even in that place of just kind of unbelief or whatever. Um, I, I just, I would love for you to take a step today and have some of our team pray for you. You know, I mean, the, the truth is, is I, I think every single one of us in the room, we have things that, that, that a circumstance will happen. And all of a sudden, there's something there that rises. There's a trigger. There's an insecurity. There's a pain. There's something that pops up. There's disappointment. And, uh, and again, it's, it's not a, that is not a shame thing. That's, that's one of the lies that the enemy tries to do is he wants us to hide. He wants to keep us down. He doesn't want us to come and bring things to the light and get in community and, and share with God. He, he, just, he wants us to kind of sweep it under the rug, gloss over it, don't really deal with it. But the reality is, is that, man, when I'm willing, and, and sometimes I mean in my own life, most of the time I had to take that step of courage. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be like Jacob. I'm going to go wrestle with this thing because I, I want to see freedom. I want to see, see the world the way Jesus does. I want to see the world the way Jesus does. And so our, our worship team, they're going to play a song. Our prayer servants are here. We'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. But let me just pray for us all right now. But Father, I just thank you that nothing is impossible with you, God. Lord, I thank you that you're the healer. Lord, that you're above disappointment. And Lord, at the end of the day, no matter what, we get to spend eternity with you. <laughs> Lord, that... And Lord, I, I just pray for every, every one of us in this room, God. Lord, I just thank you for the compassion of the Father, that you are the Father of compassion, and that you have so much compassion on us, God. And that, Father, there's no shame in the kingdom. There's none of that, Father. Even those places where we feel uncomfortable and all those things, God, you love us so much in those moments, God. And Father, I pray for a healing inside of us, Lord, that we would be a community, a church that believes. That, Lord, we would even step through some of these things of disappointment, pain, and hurt, and all of that, Father. And, Lord, we would bring it to you. We'd bring it to community. And, God, we would walk through those things and become, ultimately, the people that you have called us to be, the things that you have made available for us. And so, Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. And, Lord, I just bless every single one of these people in this room with how much you love them and how much you're for them, and how much you believe in them, Father. And Lord, I just, I just bless them in that, Father, and remind them of your great, great, great love and compassion that's flowing through this room right now, God. In Jesus' name.